This is a map of the former Soviet Union. And this is a map of what Russia looks like today. And as you can see, what was previously one giant nation is now fragmented into many different jurisdictions and nations. Or, as Putin sees it, lost land that rightfully belongs to Mother Russia. After all, he did classify the fall of the Soviet Union as the quote, greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And he describes the splitting of the USSR with a lot of frustration, saying quote, tens of millions of our fellow citizens and countrymen find themselves beyond the fringes of Russian territory. All this suggests he has dreams of restoring that lost Russian power and relevance. And on February 24th, 2022, the beginnings of this dream would come to light as the leader of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, ordered the invasion of Ukraine and changed everything forever. And if his actions are anything to go by, Ukraine is part of a bigger plan. A plan that I've spent the last month digging for and piecing together. While Putin has denied a dream to reunify the Soviet Union, it wouldn't be the first time he has gone back on his words concerning Russian military activity. It sounds absolutely insane, but after a full-scale invasion in our modern times, it's certainly not impossible. So what would it take for Putin's alleged Soviet rebirth to become a reality? Well, as you will soon learn, the chess pieces might already be in place, and the tactics he could use to fulfill this dream are a lot different than you might think. See, some former Soviet nations are already heavily influenced by the Kremlin and might not have much of a fight should an invasion happen on their soil. Take the case of Belarus. Days before the Ukraine invasion, Russian troops showed their military power at the Belarus-Ukraine border. And it's been suspected that Europe's last dictator, Alexander Lukashenko, sent troops in alongside Putin. Lukashenko, who has led the country for 28 years, also confessed that some rockets from Belarus have been launched into Ukraine. But this is to be expected, as Belarus is heavily tied in with the Kremlin economically. And the two leaders have a friendly but strange history. With massive UN and EU sanctions against the country due to Lukashenko's human rights violations to hold on to his power, Putin is his only lifeline. The Kremlin has financially bailed Belarus out before and sent military and financial backing to crush massive protests after the highly contested 2020 Belarusian elections ended with Lukashenko winning yet again. So the relationship between the two is currently in a place where one party is heavily reliant on the other. And this is not by accident. This is by design. This is demonstrated by the fact Putin has proposed that Belarus return to Russia in the past. An offer the country did decline. But that turn down doesn't matter much, as Putin already has troops in the country. Around 30,000 to be exact. He wouldn't need much of a reason either. I mean, he claimed the large ethnic Russian minority in Ukraine as a reason to run a quote, special military operation. He could do the same in Belarus. Even without invasion, Belarus, in its current state, poses as an example of what Putin might want for Ukraine, having a state directly influenced by the Kremlin while posing as an independent nation. A sort of soft annexation, you might say. And it's a recipe that might already be in use in other Kremlin-dependent nations like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Armenia. If you look at a map of Eurasia, you'll see that Kazakhstan, for example, shares its entire northern border with Russia the single largest border shared with the Federation. This means a large-scale direct invasion like the one in Ukraine might prove too difficult, as it would spread Russia's troops too thin, especially if the conflict continues in other countries. But that's the thing, Putin knows this. So that has never been the plan. Instead, it's very likely he will simply negotiate for that northern land through strong leverage. And an opportunity to do exactly that recently came up. See, Kazakh President Kasim Jumat Takayev called for help from Russia and its allies after protests ripped through the nation early this year. Following decades of the Iron Fist ruling, allegations of corruption and inequality on the government's part, frustrated Kazakh citizens took to the streets calling for reform. As things escalated, 2,500 troops were sent in to deal with protesters, and a majority of them were flown in from, you guessed it, Russia. This help could very well be used as a bargaining tool to lay claim to even more parts of northern Kazakhstan. You heard that right. 
Russia already lays claim to certain parts of northern Kazakhstan, and with such dependence on outside allies to assist in unrest, Kazakhstan might have to bend to Putin's whims as we've seen the Belarusian leadership do in the past. Now, a similar situation is happening in Turkmenistan, which has just gone through a strange election. But before I tell you the results of this election, I just want to emphasize that Turkmenistan is not a monarchy. You'll understand what I mean in a few seconds. Alright, so 73% of people apparently voted for this guy, Sadar Badimukhamedov who just so happens to be the son of the previous president, Kubenguli Badimukhamedov. Now, I'm not saying this election was rigged or anything. All I'm saying is that Russian President Vladimir Putin congratulated him shortly after the results were announced, stating it was, quote, a convincing victory. And Turkmenistan might be especially interesting because of this authoritarian rule the nation has experienced since the fall of the Soviet Union, as it breeds the perfect conditions for unrest. Furthermore, the handover of power from father to son could create some tension, and Putin could either help Turkmenistan should any unrest arise, as he did with Kazakhstan, or he could squeeze the country economically, the latter of which, as it turns out, has already begun, as the two countries recently signed a deal that ties the Turkmenistan economy with the Russian Federation. More specifically, this deal is called the Program of Economic Cooperation and it will last from 2021 to 2023. This deal is massively important to Turkmenistan as it will boost economic activity like natural gas distribution between the two. And it may already be working as intended, seeing as Turkmenistan hasn't outright condemned any of Russia's actions in Ukraine. So it seems Putin is playing the long game here. But if we focus our attention on the Caucasus region that is mainly occupied by Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia and of course parts of southern Russia, we see something interesting is happening, at least in Putin's eyes. See, Armenia and Azerbaijan are currently in a big conflict over the Nagorno-Karabakh enclave that's located right here. This enclave is not internationally recognized as sovereign, and it's neither part of Azerbaijan nor Armenia, despite being enclosed by both countries. Russia could use this disagreement as a reason to fly in troops and, quote, help solve the issue. After all, Russia has previously negotiated the 1994 peace deal that initially slowed down the fighting, but since conflict still continues to this day, it would be a perfect cover-up story and Putin could easily rally Armenia to his side. I mean, they supported the 2014 annexation of Crimea, while Azerbaijan rejected it, stating that the Nagorno-Karabakh belonged to them, much like Crimea belonged to Ukraine. Another reason why Armenia would most likely let Russia fly in a bunch of troops is the fact that it already hosts a Russian military base in the city of Gyomri, giving the Kremlin direct access to the country. But there's a slight problem, Armenia is cut off from the Russian border by Georgia and Azerbaijan, meaning Putin would have to go through Georgia, a nation that's already dealt with the Russian invasion in the past, enabled to do this. And it's really interesting because the 2008 Russia-Georgia war started the exact same way the current Ukraine war did. See, Russia claimed it was aiding separatists in South Ossetia and Abkhazia which declared independence from Georgia, much like Donetsk and Luhansk in Ukraine. Then tensions heightened when Georgia expressed interest in joining NATO. Russia then took interest in backing the breakaways, creating an opportunity to intervene, after President Mikhail Saakashvili sent troops to the contested regions to push back Russian-backed fighting. The war lasted five days, and Russian troops stopped just 48 kilometers from Georgia's capital, Tbilisi, before ceasefire agreements began. Russia still has troops in those regions today not to mention Kremlin-backed separatists, so it's certainly not impossible that something could happen here. Many fear that Moldova could have the same fate, seeing as they are disputing Transnistria, an unrecognized pro-Russian breakaway of the country. And this is largely because of troops, and to say it mildly, Moldova has a reason to be nervous. Putin currently has anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000 troops stationed in Transnistria and an estimated paramilitary force of 10,000 in Tiraspol. For comparison, Moldovan active personnel troops only round up to around 7,500. 
are you starting to see a pattern here? There is just enough division to create a window into many of the former Soviet states, and now might be the time that Putin chooses to exploit that. But there are three major roadblocks on his journey. Those are Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania. See, these nations are full-on NATO members, and they meet all the requirements, even the rule of committing 2% of their GDP to defense funding. So they would fall under the attack on one is an attack on all protection. NATO consists of 30 nations, including the nation with the most powerful military in the world, the US. For Putin to dare cross any NATO member, he would have to be prepared for retaliation from these 30 nations and be financially capable of running a war on major borders. Sure, Russia has 900,000 active military personnel, but nearly 200,000 of them are dealing with Ukraine, and if he activates those in Moldova, Georgia and Armenia, they'd simply be stretched too thin. Of course, he could go the dreaded and hopefully unlikely route that is nuclear. A nuclear war is always a looming threat, and Russia has the world's largest arsenal of nuclear warheads. But NATO nations have their own as well, so that's a surefire way to kill all of us. And as much as Putin has stated that interference with Ukraine would bring consequences never seen before in history, nuclear war doesn't benefit him either. Mutually assured destruction is too risky. At least, I hope so. But if Putin decides that the Baltic states need to be, quote, liberated, the shared borders with Latvia and Estonia make it easier. And so does the Belarus-Lithuania border. But the gathering of troops on these lines would be immediately noticed, and it's highly unlikely Putin would want to go into a full-blown war with NATO directly. I think Putin might just be testing the waters of the Western response to Ukraine while planning extensive invasions in the nations we've already discussed. And it seems likely, but not certainly, that he will stick to non-NATO members. But we'll see. I mean, if the ultimate goal is to reassemble the Soviet Union, he will have to fight NATO. But I feel like it's time we address the elephant in the room. And that is whether or not Russia would even have the resources to do this. With more sanctions against Russia coming each and every day, Putin will have to tap into Russia's $300 billion in foreign currency and gold reserves to keep this running. This fund includes some $132 billion in gold that is held within the bank of Russia's own vaults, as well as foreign currency that it holds domestically or holds abroad in countries like China that have not enforced any sanctions against Russia. And if we compare the value of these reserves to the $62 billion Russia spent on its military in 2021, combined with the price of the invasion of Ukraine, things aren't looking too bad. One estimate from the Ukrainian-based Center for Economic Recovery, a think tank close to Ukraine's government, has estimated that the first five days of the war may have cost Russia as much as $7 billion in direct military costs. Still though, most of Russia's military equipment is produced domestically, using domestic raw materials so Putin might be able to get away with covering those costs even with an inflated ruble. This means it really comes down to what Putin is willing to sacrifice to fulfill his dream. And while I hope none of this ever happens, I still want to know your thoughts. So leave them in the comments down below. But that's it for this video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.